Good evening, good evening. My computer tells me that I am live, but I always like to verify it. Hello all, comment if you are on my Rep Laurel Libby page and you can see this, I would love to know. Then I don't have to verify it myself and make sure that we really are online for tonight's live. All right, I am seeing it. So hello, hi Alex. All right, we've got a, a viewer or two on. So I'm very excited to be here with you guys tonight. And uh, the reason is that I am I am not the, the primary person on here tonight. I have some guests on tonight that I'm very excited about. Uh, tonight's live is called Let's Talk Energy. And I'm seeing people saying hello already. Hello, Heather and Kimberly and Sheila. Glad to see you guys on. Hi, Phyllis, thank you for letting me know. Um, I'm so glad to welcome you guys here tonight. So this live is Let's Talk Energy. You know, I don't know if any of you have been seeing uh, high electricity bills coming to your mailbox or your email inbox over the last couple of months, but I have been hearing from tons of constituents and my fellow Mainers all over the state asking the same question. Why is my electricity bill so high? Um, I've, I've heard from folks whose electricity bill is, you know, it's it's doubled from 100 to 200 dollars, and then from folks who've literally gotten an electricity bill that is for thousands of dollars. And so, what is up with electricity prices? Um, and then, in heating oil and gas, just our prices are going up on everything that keeps us running here in Maine in the winter. And so, what? What is up? We all need to be informed on these issues that so drastically affect our everyday life. So tonight, I'm excited to have um, two energy experts on because I am not an energy expert. And I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. But first, I would ask for you guys to please help increase our engagement and share this live right now, because I don't know of a single person who wouldn't like to be up to speed on what's going on with electricity and energy prices here in Maine. So please click the share button and share this live with your friends and family, invite them to come along and hear about what is going on in our state so we can all be up to speed together. Click the like button, make sure that you comment and that will all help uh, with engagement and make sure that we can get eyes on this broadcast. So let me let me hear from folks who are sharing. Throw that in the comments and let me know when you have shared this live. And we will, awesome, Danielle has shared. Who else? Who else has shared the live? We're getting more eyes on, so you guys must be doing a good job. Who else has shared? Throw it right in the comments. Julie, did I watch the rally last night? No, I did not, but I, somebody did send it to me today, so maybe I'll have a chance to later. All right, uh, the eyes on the broadcast are ticking up quickly. Thank you, Randy, for sharing. Awesome. Okay, keep sharing away, guys, but I am going to introduce uh, the first person who is going to be joining the broadcast tonight, and uh, that is uh, someone that you may know from his weekly long-standing appearance on the George Hale and Rick Tyler show, where he is their tech advisor on energy. Not only their tech advisor on energy, but this gentleman was the technical advisor on energy to former Governor Paul LePage for eight years. Jim Lebrecht is a self-taught mechanical and electrical systems and designer, and I'm thrilled to have him on here tonight to answer your questions and our questions. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Why don't you say a few words and introduce yourself a little more to our guests? Well, uh, I'm uh, so sorry that we had to meet under these circumstances of high <laughs> energy costs, but uh, anybody that listens to me on the George Hale Rick Tyler show would uh, see that I uh, have been uh, uh, very uh, been wanting about this for a very long time. Our energy policies on the national and state level have been heading in the wrong direction, especially the main uh, policy directions for since the oil embargo of 73, we've been heading down the wrong road and uh, it would take a lot more than an hour to go through all the legislation that was passed uh, that has uh, caused us great harm. But probably one of the most important things I want to leave to the public here in, in the opening is that why energy is so critical is that that is what brings us our standard of living. 
And when you increase energy costs, that cost permeates every single purchase you make, whether it's uh, your groceries at the grocery store, whether it's your taxes coming in from the city or town where they have to pay more to light the schools and uh, heat the schools and town offices and everything. Uh, it, there's nothing that uh, avoids the high cost of electricity that passes it on. So what you end up paying on your electric bill as an increase each month is a very small part of what your total amount you're paying uh, in for energy through the purchase of everything you buy. Well, thank you. I think that's a great introduction to what we're going to be talking about tonight, Jim. Uh, my, my next guest is the state representative from Berwick. This is Representative Beth O'Connor, and she has previously served on the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee, and she can speak to how the policies that have been passed in the legislature in our state um, are affecting us here and now. So welcome tonight, Representative O'Connor. We're so glad to have you. Thank you very much, Representative Libby. It's a <laughs> pleasure to be here. And I just want to put this out front. I am not the expert here. I can tell you how policy is made. I can tell you how sausage is made in the legislature. But Jim Lebrec is without a doubt the energy expert. He actually has been my mentor in learning. And I have learned a lot from him. But when we do, when we talk about policy and how that policy is made, it need, I need to be clear that everybody that goes to the legislature is not an expert. I was not an expert when I served on energy utilities and technology for four years. Mm -hmm. However, I looked at both sides to every bit of information. I looked at those sides because I didn't know anything at all. And what I learned was money is what mm -hmm. really moves policy, especially in the energy committee. There were times when we would have, um, you know, over 10,000 billing hours sitting in front of us for attorneys coming to make their mark. And this is one of the reasons that policy is so high and it is actually really detrimental to each and every one of us. And what happens when we pass policies, then the rate payers, especially in energy utilities and technology, whether it be the electric rate payers, the water and sewer rate payers, um, any your your broadband bill, any um, you know any of those different services, as soon as the legislature gets involved, those prices go up. And the reason, and Jim Lebrec can absolutely say that this is so. The reason that this happens is because years ago, the engineers and the planners were removed from the process. And now instead of the experts making policy, it is legislators. And I can tell you my claim to fame, I am a waitress, a bartender, and an excellent cook and a wonderful mother and grandmother. That's my area of expertise. I had to learn all of this. And mm -hmm. there's no way that every legislator understands the policies that they're making. Mm -hmm. And so we all should be more diligent. I know you are Rep Representative Libby, and I try to be diligent because my job as a state representative is to protect all of the people. Because if one section of the state isn't healthy, then the rest of the state is not healthy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for underscoring that, Representative O'Connor. Although I think I think we can let's settle in and get a little more casual tonight. We're going to be talking about a lot of uh, really complicated issues. So I, I'm going to go with Laurel, and if you go with Beth, I think we can uh, just have a have a quick you know conversation and um, join with the Mainers who are watching all over the state. You guys, please throw comments in. If you have further questions about what we're talking about, throw it in the comments and let's keep this conversation going. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to start with the question that is on everyone's mind. Uh, when that electricity bill comes every month, uh, it has been shocking uh, Mainers all around the state. So why did our CMP bills go up? Why are we seeing a huge increase? What is this 89% we're all hearing about? And remember that some of us whose background is nurses or you know any other job out there, we haven't had the time on committee that you have. So explain it, uh, Jim and Beth, if you can, in um, you know everyday English that all of us all of us can comprehend as we try to figure this out. You want me to go, or you want to? <laughs> Yeah, it's up to you, Beth. Go ahead. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you a brief rundown and Jim can expand on this. So basically what a lot of people don't understand is that um, electricity is a secondary energy source. And to get electricity, we have to have primary energy sources. Those primary energy sources are natural gas, oil, coal, hydro, nuclear, hydro. I love, it's green, it's clean. We also have biomass, which is not really great because it's only 26% efficient. We have solar and wind, which I won't even get into those because we will later. Mm -hmm. However, without those primary sources, our secondary source, source doesn't work. We see these increases because the price of all those resources that we use for baseload power has skyrocketed. And that is reflected in your energy costs, in your electricity costs. So am I understanding this correctly? What you're saying is that as the price of natural gas, oil, all of those have gone up, that's part of the increase that we're seeing in our electricity bill. Yes, that's called that's supp the supply side. And so when those costs goes up, our supply sides go up. And unfortunately, that's we, we are going to see a lot more of that. And I'm afraid people are going to be not only saddled with the outrageous electric bills, they are going to be saddled with the um, oil, the gas. And, and I can't say it enough. Policy matters. And our legislators at the federal level, as well as the state level, are passing very bad legislation that is detrimental to each and every one of us. And it's extremely detrimental to the poor and those on fixed incomes. Well, that's very, very clarifying. Thank you, Beth. The, so there's two pieces to that bill, right? So, and you're talking about that's the, that is the supply side, right? Yes. So yes. then the services or the delivery, why is that going up as well? Transmission and distribution has also gone up and Jim can correct me if I'm wrong. However, it was FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission ordered um, the state of Maine. It wasn't just Central Maine Power, Versant, uh, Kenny Bunk Leighton Power, but all of the small energy pro um, electric providers, as well as, um, you know, the large ones, CMP and Versant, CMP being the, the largest, were um, they were told that they had no choice. They had to do work on the grid because the number one of the number one things about T and D is not just transmission and dis distribution. It's ensuring that the grid is stable and reliable. And we needed upgrades to our grid in the state of Maine. Therefore, FERC said, "Yes, you can. You you can raise these rates because nobody works for free. Nobody pays their people to do these jobs for free." So. These costs have to be paid for and they're going to be paid for to, to ensure that when you go to flick your switch, you're going to have power. So it was virtually what I see that increase on T&D. I see that as what FERC instituted to cover the, the increasing grid costs, which are also increasing because of the um, proposed, all the proposed solar uh, developments and wind developments in the state. We need a grid upgrade. So that's that's national influence and federal influence on the, on the price is what you're saying. Correct. Correct. And Jim, Jim, correct me or add. Yeah. Well, I think the part that isn't uh, federally mandated are things uh, that main policymakers have uh, really cost us a lot. For instance, they uh, they put in a bill that uh, required that the power companies had to buy electricity from all these wood fired electric uh, generating plants where they put wood in and make electricity. And uh, they're only, as Beth said, you know, in the height to mid 20% efficient. So that means let's say you put in four truckloads of wood uh, into a, into the system, you get one truckload of electricity and three truckloads of heat get wasted right out in the middle of the woods, just gets blown wow. away. And uh, we would have been able to co-gen that stuff and use that heat for like paper mills and require that those plants be put at paper mills, then that would have been an economical thing. It would have saved the mills in my hometown of uh, uh, J. Main, uh, the old mm -hmm. international paper company closed down because they couldn't, couldn't handle volatility of oil. At the same time, just down the river, about three miles, they put up a... Uh, uh, a, a one of those wood, uh, wood fired generating plants and then CMP 
was forced by legislators to buy back the contract for $25 million, including buying back the contract for one that even wasn't even built by the same person for $25 million. And they had to go out and borrow all this money. So far, those costs, I think it was $2 billion mm -hmm. for that mistake for all of these uh, wood-fired operations. Now, that gets put on your T&D bill every month for years in the form of stranded costs. So there's been a lot of mm -hmm. stranded costs. Some of the stranded costs going on your bill here today is from this high cost of all these solar farms you see going up. They're getting 400, four times the price for their electricity than what there is on the open market. So what happens is that that is up to $360 million a year right now, above market costs that ratepayers have to pay. And uh, that's $7.2 billion over the life of that contract that you, the ratepayers out there, are going to have to pay every single month for the term of that contract until... Uh, they get their $7.2 billion. Uh, wow. So those are added into T&D. There's a lot of mistakes, mm -hmm. problems, and in, in, uh, in legislation from special interest groups that get their electricity, mm -hmm. the uh, offshore wind for two windmills at, uh, oh. from the university. That mm -hmm. project was going to cost, if it goes through, it's $200 million above market costs. Hang on, um, Jim, yeah. you just said... For two, two, I'm moving the wrong way here. This is two, one, two, two windmills. Right. Two windmills. Hundred million dollars. hundred over the life of that contract, right. And uh, so uh, when I was with Governor LePage, we had the uh, the hearing on that particular bill opened up again because it was too expensive. The technology changed over time. They went five years and didn't do anything. Technology changed, marketplace changed, and so we said, let's have another hearing. We did. And the PUC, after all the evidentiary hearings, said, no, it's not a good deal. You know, Massachusetts was buying some stuff for six cents and they were going to start off at 22 cents. And I think eventually get up to 42 cents a kilowatt hour. Wow. And uh, so that come up to 200 million. You know, that didn't go through yet. But uh, yeah. but then right after the PUC Shot it down after all the hearings. Well, hang on. Don't talk about the PUC yet, Jim. You're leading into uh, the next oh. section here. Let's hold right there okay. for a quick minute if we can. Um, I don't want to throw too much at folks and keep an eye on the comments. And I'm seeing some questions about the PUC, and that is going to be coming right up. So uh, if I could summarize, the long and short is that we have issues with um, the legislation that's been passed. We have federal mandates. Uh, we have... Uh, the two different sides of the electricity bills, one side where we've got gas, natural gas, and the, all the other ways that electricity is produced, that cost to produce the electricity has gone up, as well as the delivery side of it. Is that uh, an accurate summary of where we're at so far? It's, it's a... Yes. Uh, <laughs> Layman's uh, terms? It's an introduction. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it, it's very complex, very, very involved. And there are a lot of very, very serious problems, very deep and serious problems. And yeah. we're, we're just starting. The problems you're seeing with your electric bill right now is the beginning, not the end. I'm sorry to say. I don't want to be a negative guy, but I'm going to tell you like it is. Yeah, well, that that sounds very, very doomsday. I'm I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation now, but maybe dreading it a little bit, too. So, um, so we've talked a little bit about kind of... Uh, what what is behind that bill, but what determines the price of electricity? And let's now tie in the PUC. What is the PUC? Who makes up that board? And how do they affect the price of our electricity? Go ahead, Beth. Okay. So <laughs> the PUC is, it's actually the MPUC. It's the Main Public Utilities Commission. That commission is, um, they're, they work for, they're supposed to work for us, for all of the electric rate payers, for um, anything that comes before us. They're supposed to work for us and they're supposed to work in our best interest, which oftentimes they do. They come before the legislature and they tell us exactly what is going to happen. Um, but oftentimes I've noticed that they do do the best job they can. They are paid by the taxpayers to work in our best interest. But 
oftentimes it is political. And depending on who's been appointed is the information that you get the sway or the lean to. Um, and under this particular administration, the PUC is headed up by the chairman is Phil Bartlett, who was the um, one of the chairs of the main Democrat party. And Wait a second. Wait a second. He must be an energy expert of some kind though, right? I mean, these people, can they be appointed to the PUC just because of political ties or do they have to have, you know, some extraordinary expertise? It, uh, how many people are we talking about here that are on this board? It's five, I believe. Three. I thought it was three. Is it three? Yeah, it is three. It three. is three. three. It's, okay. yeah, it's the so main, they, they it's the, be, the main you know, is five. Yeah. Okay. So, but decades, decades of energy experience, right? He was no. a lawyer, but he was on the energy committee at one time before he became the chairman of the Democratic Party for Maine. Well, and Beth is on the Energy Committee, too, and she's already told us she was a waitress and a bartender. I am not qualified say, to be on, on that. <laughs> Being I, on I mean, the Energy I, Committee does not necessarily qualify you. No, it does not qualify you. <laughs> and I can tell you, in my four years on that committee, I probably did more research and actually had real knowledge than Phil Bartlett had. L let me, uh, yeah. I waited. I weighed in on the LePage administration and discussions on who should be on the committee when Governor LePage was governor. And we decided that the best combination was to get a lawyer, an engineer, and an economist. That was the best blend. Okay. You, you're dealing with economics, you're dealing with sure. law, and you're dealing with engineering. Sure, that that was sense. the best combination. That's exactly what Governor LePage had mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. Uh, he got done. Wow. Well, I, I would I would certainly love to hear more about that in the future. Look, I, I'm getting quite an education tonight. Um, so, so what effect does the PUC have on our price of electricity? <laughs> Jim, is that well, it? Uh, it's just I, signs, I, so. Overall, I think they've been doing a pretty good job. Uh, for instance, when the uh, hearing got reopened again on the on the University of Maine uh, two windmills uh, they did make a decision that they should uh, you know not let it go through because it wasn't in the best interest of the public okay now unfortunately uh, and it was I uh, hate to say a Republican Dave Woodson Senator Woodson put the bill put a bill in an emergency bill to uh, overturn everything that the PUC mm. and the DEP and everybody spent uh, a year in, in hearings and uh, contested hearings, uh, evidentiary hearings and mm. appeals and everything else. And then he just put in an emergency bill and turned it upside down and boom, all that was for naught. You know, it's bad when legislators, uh, without knowing what the heck they're doing, just put in bills to overturn all of these uh, agencies. Now, the agencies can make mistakes and sometimes there's politics, but you know what? Uh, it's tougher under the PUC proceedings because this is run just like a court. In fact, it is a, it a, is court, a court and, and it does go to appeal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do use appeals in every almost every matter. So mm -hmm. it isn't like you can uh, stick it to somebody with politics uh, like you can in, a, in just a legislative hearing. Mm -hmm. But but the legislature can overturn whatever it is the Public Utilities um, Commission has said. They don't have to work in in. So the PUC does put forward what's in all of our best interests to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. The legislature oftentimes, just like with Dave Woodsum overturning that, he was the chair, the Senate chair of the Energy Committee at that time. Those hearings were really, um, really terrible hearings, listening to a lot of the damage that was done. I looked for information on all of those hearings and I asked for information from, it was Habib Dagar was in, you know, in charge of this and um, they wouldn't give me all the answers to the questions that I asked about ice chipping and about how much energy this would um, when we had a full scale model. Well, the one eighth size scale model that they used to launch this with, I forget how much the lines cost, but it was a mm -hmm. minimum to run to the, to the mainland. And so I finally had to get that information from central main power and for a $500,000 investment, 
the energy created sent to the mainland was worth $220 for a full year. So oh gosh. yes, these are the things and oh legislators God. without, you know, people, well-heeled individuals come up, you know how they testify yeah. in energy. I can tell you oftentimes, like I said before, to millions of people, it, if not millions, but thousands, sometimes we have over 10,000 hours of, of, lawyers sitting there, billing hours, sitting in front of the e wow. EUT committee. So it's all, it's money and the money and who talks and it shapes the policy. And it's also special interest and in energy is probably one of the most special interest driven com committees that I've served on. Well, and we're going to be talking about some of those special interests in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I'm going to I'm going to move away from uh, committees and and all of that and ask a really specific question that that I've been getting a lot of. Uh, I've been hearing from folks who say we invested in heat pumps. They're supposed to be the most amazing way to heat and cool your house. And now all of a sudden, my electricity bill has skyrocketed. What do I do? So. What do you say to folks who who are have dipped into the land of heat pumps and and how can we get some relief here? Yeah, so uh, that's my specialty. I'm a thermodynamist that dealt with uh, refrigeration cycles for 50 years now, and uh, I was the one that put the heat pump program together for Governor LePage. That was his governor's bill, and mm -hmm. uh, the idea of it was to reduce the amount of oil that we use because that's where our carbon is. Uh, Maine is the most dependent state per capita on oil of any nation, any state in the nation. Mm. So, uh, but we use the least amount of electricity. Also, our electricity is arguably either the third or the fourth, depends on which side of the argument you're on, cleanest electricity in the nation. Mm -hmm. So when you take a heat pump and you put one unit of clean electricity into it, you get that unit of energy as electric heat in your house, plus the heat pump grabs two more equal amounts of energy from outside and pushes that into your house. So you buy one, you get three, okay? And it's very, very clean. So, and then that displaces the oil in your in your uh, oil, you know, in, from you burning oil. So now when you put money into a solar panel, that solar panel displaces pretty damn clean electricity, right? And it's a very high cost for the, uh, you know, for the solar panels relative to a heat pump. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's displacing clean electricity. So when you look at it and run all the numbers, a heat pump is eight times more cost effective at reducing the CO2 uh, than a solar panel. So for every million dollars worth of heat pumps you put in, you have to put in $8 million worth of solar panels to give you the same CO2 savings. Wow. But now, mm -hmm. So, but now what's happened is that all these, all this bad legislation is driving the, is driving the cost of electricity way up. Mm -hmm. And also the heat pump is what's paying the biggest part of uh, solar for people that have a heat pump. Uh, they end up paying twice as much as a general rule for their T and D because their bill is twice as high, let's say, for their home. Okay. So they contribute okay. twice, as, twice as much for the delivery of that over for the fixed cost. Fixed cost is all the wires and transformers and everything that you have mm -hmm. and the service and you know backing that all up and reading the meter and all that kind of stuff. Well, mm -hmm. that's fixed cost. So you use more electricity, but you don't require more fixed cost. Okay. So okay. What happens so hang on. Can I ask you a question on, on that, Jim, then? So yeah. if I'm understanding this layman here, layman question. So if I'm understanding you quickly, because because the cost of the supply has gone up, it, the, the primary source, right? It, gas. No, and that's separate. That's separate. Completely so, separate. so that doesn't affect the price of you know electricity mm -hmm. going up with heat pumps because you're because you're providing your heat through that that means with a heat pump which requires electricity. I'm just wondering if the high prices of oil and gas and and all of that that we've seen go up is part of what's driving. Um, you know, obviously you need electricity to run a heat pump. Is that part of what's driving that that 
that uh, increase there? Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, it's it's uh, it's a little bit more convoluted and complex <laughs> than that. But uh, <laughs> let me put it this way. So uh, if everybody is using the same amount of electricity, right, and they all make their same contribution to the transmission distribution system, and now I put in a heat pump, now I'm paying uh, twice, the, I'm using twice the amount of electricity. So now mm -hmm. my contribution of T&D is double. In the meantime, a neighbor puts in the solar panel, he's using less, so he's paying less for the for the uh, use of that system. So uh, okay. what happens is that the way it unfolds is that heat pump people are the ones subsidizing the solar people in a very big way to the point yeah. where it's going to break the back of something that's eight times more cost effective at accomplishing uh, the goals of reducing CO2. Okay. And uh, but one of the things that we had in the LePage administration at the very end, uh, we worked on a bill and uh, uh, Beth was uh, part of that was a rate restructuring bill. And what's happening is that people with second homes and camps and solar panels and stuff like that, they don't pay their full cost for using the T&D. You know, if you have a camp and you pay 12 or $14 a month, uh, mm -hmm. And you think of the expense. They had to do all the engineering, surveying. They had to get all the easements, all the legal work. They had to construct that line, buy all the poles and wires and transformers and mm -hmm. meters and everything and get that. And then they have to read the meters. They have to supply meters. They have to, uh, uh, they have to be out there to service it at three in the morning when a tree falls on the branch. And uh, would, would you would you be willing to invest in all that if i said i'm going to give you 12 dollars a month you know it, right it right cost. so what happens is that cost and then the solar people aren't paying anything mm -hmm. for their t and d to speak of they get paid to use it so it's oh, a okay. double dip situation and i make this uh i i reference this to uh, you driving a Prius, so when you go down the turnpike, instead of paying two fifty, they give you two dollars fifty cents because you're driving a Prius, right? right? So there's less people paying in and more people pulling out. So therefore, the pe next guy that drives up and he doesn't have a Prius, he's got to cover all that additional cost. It's the same thing with the heat pump and solar panel uh, scenario. So basically, if you've invested in a heat pump, here here's your answer. Here's your answer, Corey. You're you're helping pay for solar. <laughs> That's the long and short. That's if you've right. invested yeah. in a heat pump, but, you're helping pay for solar. But if uh, we if uh, Governor LePage gets back in there, I'm sure we're going to be working on right where we left off at the end, and that is a rate restructuring bill where everybody pays their equal amount to use the T and D system. Everybody has that fixed cost. It's a fixed cost every month for it. For the utility so you just pay them mm -hmm. your share of that fixed cost it's a fixed cost every month on your bill and then how much electricity where you buy it from is a variable so we had a program laid out called nine for 90 with that and if you everybody paid their share of the meter and in t and d costs then you could get electricity for like around nine cents a kilowatt hour which would be equivalent to 90 cent oil right now that's what wow. you pay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to work real hard on getting that in there. Nine for 90, we call it. Remember that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Jim. Uh, 90 cent oil sounds really good to me right now. Uh, we are on propane, and I can tell you that it is not 90 cents. Uh, so question, moving on from, from this to kind of a new area we haven't really talked about yet, hydro. Why don't we use hydro? Why aren't we pursuing main-based hydro? That one's Beth. She's been working on the hundred <laughs> megawatt okay. thing. She's got that bill. She she just dusts it off every year and reapplies <laughs> things and dates and reapplies it. Well, it's so it has been an ongoing bill. And actually, what I found in I submitted the um, we have a hydro cap, so we have a hundred megawatt hydro cap, and so every year I would submit the bill to remove the hundred watt, you know cap on that 100 megawatt cap but every year it would fail and i couldn't understand it and then it got to a point as so the bottom line who killed the hydro and our own dams was the biomass industry 
actually was the ones who came out in full-fledged opposition to lifting the 100 megawatt cap. Now, I understood why they did it, because if we lifted that cap, their 26%, basically 26% efficiency and not really a good use of power, mm -hmm. unless you are cogeneration, they kept coming after this because they were the ones that were going to lose money. And in that particular, um, every time that I submitted it, it was the Democrat legislators that killed this legislation. And should we have hydro in the state? Absolutely. We should definitely have hydro in the state. And it is political. And it is always, you always follow the money. And that is what happened. And now um, we are trying to get the, you know, 1,200 megawatts of energy from Hydro-Quebec, which was a phenomenal deal for every single solitary one of us. And I thought, well, that's a heck of a lot higher than the 100 megawatt cap, you know, that the 100 mm -hmm. megawatts. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's a lot higher. How are we able to get that? Well, evidently, we're able to get that because it is coming from already existing hydropower sources that are outside of the state of Maine. And we brought that in and it was both governors really liked it. So now our special interests that are creating once again, huge money with solar power, Nextera and Calpine mm -hmm. are the ones that killed the NEC, the Clean Energy Connect. They killed that because they were going to lose a million dollars a day from their solar investments and other investments for renewable energy sources. That is one of the reasons why we can't get hydro from Quebec right now. Can I add something okay. on that, Laura? Absolutely. Yeah, let me ask a question first, because this is what I'm hearing again, layman's perspective here. So what I'm hearing is that regardless of whether it's hydro from in Maine, hydro from out of Maine, whatever there's kind of battling special interests that, uh, you know, it's not good for them. So they don't want it. Um, is hydro in general good for Maine people? I mean, is that a nominal cost for, for nominal? It's baseload <laughs> power. It is green. It is clean. It is renewable. I can't tell you how much carbon mm -hmm. it, that corridor would have removed. It was the most environmentally sound project that has ever, ever hit the pike here. And for anybody to say otherwise is full of baloney and probably had a camp along that line. And I know a few people who that is the case. And But yes, hydro is green. Mm -hmm. It is clean. It is baseload power. It is easily dispatchable. And we should have more of it and we should use it at every turn that we possibly can. So regardless of where folks fall on the corridor, it sounds like we absolutely should not have this somewhat arbitrary, it sounds like, cap on um, how much hydro we can produce ourselves in our state. Absolutely, that is so. However, um, when I looked deep and after the the biomass, the stranded mm -hmm. costs for biomass and things like that were um, dissipating, it was evident. It was still a savings, but it was virtually a $12 million a year savings if we lifted that cap. And at that point in time, it was just more of, of you know, it would have been a $12 million savings, which in wow. the giant scheme of things mm -hmm. is not that much money. Right. When you consider that the law that was passed for solar right now um, by mm -hmm. the Mills administration, increasing community solar farms from 660 watt kilowatt mm -hmm. hours, kilowatts to um, mm -hmm. up to five megawatts and increasing the community participation from nine individuals to 200. Mm -hmm. When you look at that policy, Jim said the number earlier, it's $7.2 billion over the life of those contracts. 12 million is really a drop yeah. in the bucket. So, so we're going to go on to solar next, but Jim, I know you had a thought you wanted to share. So go ahead and then yeah. we're going to, we're going to hit solar. So in the uh, 90s, uh, the legislature put in a law that said that the uh, for deregulation of our electricity generation, they said, we want competition. So uh, what this, all of these competing sources of electric generation are all against hydro, which is the most efficient and most valuable. You know, solar's against it, wind's against it. Uh, because of the energy credits, production tax credits, and so forth, renewable energy credits. But uh, then, in this case, Calpine, who has gas-powered gas generation in the state, and uh, 
and then uh, Next Era, who has oil fired, mm -hmm. they're against it because they were going to lose up to $3 million a day, those two companies, mm -hmm. uh, together, if the NECC line went through. That's why a lot of people don't know it, but all of the millions of dollars for all the legal opposition to this, all of the millions of dollars for advertisements that you see every minute of the day throughout mm -hmm. this, all of the uh, costs for the uh, not only one, but two referendums mm -hmm. all came from primarily from Next Era and Kelpine because they had a lot to lose. Now it's proven to be that now that uh, now that their cost of gas and oil has gone way up, that money that cost you extra money, uh, the, the amount that cost you extra money every month is mm -hmm. going directly into their pockets. They've already received all of their money, a big return on their investment already by trying to kill off hydro. So everybody's trying to kill off hydro because they all have a special in the biomass, as she said, everybody wants to kill off hydro. It's too so, effective. So in summary then, and, and we're about to go into <laughs> solar, but it's, and I, I think you're going to say it's the same thing. So, so we have, Mainers who need low cost electricity and we have special interest just beating each other up and uh, convincing our legislature to pass poor policies that don't benefit, you know, our our families all around Maine. It, and it's being driven by who's who's yeah. bought, who's going to lose the most on their bottom dollar. I mean, that's well, just a terrible way to pass policy. Let me let me let me inject that. Uh, you live it. That the, <laughs> yeah. uh, that the special interest organizations are driving the legislators down there. Yeah, they are the ones that demand and tell them which way to vote, how to vote, when to vote. Uh, and uh, so we have to get our legislators back under control because mm -hmm. right now those special interest groups are walking all over them and they're controlling them whereas they're and they're, they're making decisions that are in the special interests mm -hmm. so uh, let's talk about one of those special interests how about how about solar why do we have so many solar farms going in who is benefiting from it are we subsidizing it what is what is the bottom line on solar and are our main people benefiting from it because you know our uh, mainers should be the ones benefiting from any of these policies so beth why don't we start from you give us the skinny on solar so i've been fighting this battle with jim for a long time um 10 years i really got into it in the energy committee and what it is is there's just there's so much fluff out there about it and how wonderful it is and so a lot of people buy into the stories that it's green it's clean it's renewable and it sounds good and it's um you know it, it just it, it sounds good but then when you start looking into it it's not good but this the sound bites are so constant that it's green, it's clean, and it's renewable. And I can't say that enough, but that's not the case. And it can't be, it, it cannot be um, a primary energy source ever because it's 15% oh, wow. capacity factor. So it'll never, it'll never, ever reach that. Plus it's extremely- So hang on, expensive. this is something very brand new to me, Beth. So I need you to back up here a second. Uh, as far as I understood it, you know, someday solar is going to rule the world and that's going to be all the electricity we need. You're telling me that it, it can't by itself be our primary no. source of electricity? There's no way possible. Number one, if you took all of the silver in the world that is currently in existence, every single solitary bit of it, and you tried to build the solar panels with that silver, you would only be able to blanket 1% of the earth with solar. Um, in addition to that, it takes a lot of, you know, rare earth minerals. It would be absolutely impossible to do that. And it's also the problem is mm. that um, that with solar energy, even though the costs have come down, it is still highly subsidized because of all the fluff that surrounds it and people won't do the dip, the deep dive mm. um, on, on what it actually does. Mm -hmm. So we are still subsidizing it at, it at a huge rate. If we killed our net metering policy and we killed the policy that allowed community solar to expand from 660 kilowatts to, um, 
to f up to five megawatts. If we killed that and we absolutely killed the subsidies in the net, net metering program where net metering is the program where solar investors and solar owners are paid for the electrons that go out onto the grid from their systems, but those can't be controlled. Electrons can't be stored basically. So usually the system doesn't need those um, electrons at the time when these people are pumping it out and they're getting mm -hmm. paid 20 cents a kilowatt instead of three and a half cents a kilowatt. Mm -hmm. um, wait, so wait, 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 wait. <laughs> How much a kilowatt? <laughs> Hang on. My ears just got that. How much per kilowatt are they getting paid? Versus so, how much? so retail, they're getting, they're probably getting about 20 cents a kilowatt when, when they shouldn't be getting more than seven. No, seven. no, no. Less so, than, they should it, be getting three and a half. Three That's and a half. Get. The competitive right. market right. sells electricity for three and a half cents. Right. That's but what are we, so are we subsidizing that? Then? Yes. You are so subsidizing. We, right there, we the, are you subsidizing. That is those over, over those contracts because of the law signed by Governor Janet Mills. The over rate that we will pay, non-solar customers will pay to mostly out-of-state big investors and to solar owners. We will all pay all of us that are non-solar will pay over the next 20 years of those contracts, we will pay $7.2 billion. As of right now, um, Bill, yeah, Bill Harwood, he's the um, public advocate, said on February 22nd, 2022, he said clearly that what keeps him up at night is the solar policy that we have. And if all of the solar developments come into play, that it's going to be a minimum of $360 million annually on each one of our bills. Now, you have to think about that because you think of Hannaford is one of the largest employers in the state of mm -hmm. Maine and their refrigeration units, they use a lot of mm -hmm. electricity. And so when they have to pay these higher prices for us, it might be $10 a month on our bill, $15 a month on our bill. But when they pay it, it's a million dollars on their bill. And when that happens, it's, we get, the cost of all the goods and services go up. So it's really right. convoluted. It's a big, mm -hmm. it's a big round. So yes, we are paying. In addition to that, there was a 30, um, 30% 30 tax credit from the federal government for solar that has since been cut to 26. The reason we're seeing such a huge solar gold rush is because the chances are very good that, um, that, that solar subsidy will go at the federal level. And there is also a gold rush. So people want to get it now. It's they like, get, get yeah. it now because this is this is not going to be here forever, folks. Big, so grab big, your federal exactly. subsidies. You so can. Not only grab your federal subsidies, if the legislature is taken over by Republicans, which hopefully it will be, um, if Governor LePage gets in in the state of Maine, the net energy billing policies, the contracts that are already in place will remain in place because contract law is our last bastion of one of our last bastions of freedom here. You have a contract, you sign for it. You have a responsibility kind of just like kids with their college debt. Mm -hmm. You have a responsibility to, you know, so, but if we can stop it now mm -hmm. and stop this from happening and do this in a smarter manner, then we're not going to see this gold solar gold rush, but those net energy billing will go away. So we're so we're kind of we're in a place where like we're stuck with what we've got for solar yes. and we're we're going to be subsidizing that because we've yes. got the contract but we can stop from advancing the policy in the future so that we the ratepayer are not subsidizing solar you know it, to the extent that we are what I'm wrapping my mind around is what you're talking about you know Hannaford, given the example of a grocery store, a grocery chain, that blows my mind. So not only are our food prices going up because, of course, fuel, you know, paying for fuel just to drive our groceries to that store, that's going up. But we're also seeing an increase in those prices because of subsidizing solar, you're saying. 
that is one of the reasons that you will see increased prices. It is not as bad as it will be because that solar gold rush has just started. They know there's a window, a very small window. That window hopefully will be closing. And but we need to look at that. And I do see um, positive things happening. There are multiple towns in the state of Maine that have actually um, gone and, and on solar moratoriums because they're not sure of the effects. Uh, when the PUC the public advocate are saying what these costs are going to be, we have to put the brakes on. And thus far that I could find, um, I believe 16 towns have already put in solar moratoriums. So that'll slow it down a little, but it's coming to a town near you. And mm -hmm. I, if you don't pay attention, a lot of this stuff flies under the radar. We're doing one here in Berwick right now. Mm -hmm. And virtually it has been under the radar. Myself, who is very involved in this, I did not know. I'll be at their planning board meeting next Thursday night. Wow. Um, and so it's happening everywhere. It's coming to a community near you. So folks, look out for this. Thank you, Beth. I think Beth might be experiencing some issues with her internet. You're a little fuzzy, Beth, but I hope you can stick with us for a couple more minutes. It's time to wrap up. Thank you so much. Um, there were a million more questions I think we all could have asked, but thank you for dumbing down what you, the, the breadth of your knowledge. Uh, for those of us who are lay people, I really appreciate it. Um, Jim, can you, can you give us uh, your last two minutes on what what our fellow Mainers need to know as we are looking at these rising costs of electricity and all we've heard about with solar. Give us your last wrap up in two minutes. Okay. Uh, it's uh, a security issue. Energy security issue is what I've been pounding on the radio and on all my speeches from St. Agat to York, uh, Maine. And uh, we have a short-term security issue in the long term. Short-term is what we're facing right now, where we pass up clean, large-scale, uh, renewable energy from Hydro-Quebec, and instead we're relying on, for instance, Russia and Venezuela and places, mm -hmm. right, to get our, uh, our energy, our dirty energy. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one thing. But the long-term is that Maine uh, is, going, is not going to be able to compete in the future for the high valued price of oil because the 38 developing countries in this in this world are going to be increasing our energy demand by 2050 to they're going to increase at 47 percent 37 percent of that's going to be in the form of liquid fuels that we have to compete for. And they're going to be using it for things yeah. like rubber and paint and grease and oils and uh, all kinds of plastics and all kinds of stuff that have much higher value. You can pay a lot more for those things than you can mm -hmm. just to pour it in your gas tank and uh, burn it up. Mm -hmm. So uh, Maine being the number one dependent, the, 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 the most dependent state in the country on oil, uh, we have to get off from oil we're not off from oil, but we have to have a major reduction in our oil and we have to transfer that to hydro. You will not do uh, away with oil from solar panels. I said this on the radio this week and it really raised a lot of feathers here. And, uh, and I'll tell you right now, when you run the numbers, if you take the best solar panels out in the market today, 350 watts, and you want to keep up with one burning one gallon of oil an hour, you know, mm. for heat, and you want to have solar panels run an electric heater for your house that keeps up with the equivalent heat of burning one gallon of oil an hour. That's 1,000 solar panels in a winter time when they have a 10% wow. capacity factor at a thousand dollars a piece installed costs without batteries. That's a million dollars to keep up with one gallon of oil an hour. That's a matter of fact. And wow. uh, if anybody tries to argue with that, Tell them to put the numbers down and I'll take a look at them for you. Okay. All well, right. Thank you, Jim. I, I And I'll tell them to tune in and listen to you every week and they can, uh, they can learn, learn yeah. from you. When, anytime. Wednesday mornings at six o'clock down your way. It's 101.3. Yes, it is. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. I, you know, and you guys, we didn't even get to talking about nuclear power, France versus Germany, all of that, but maybe next time, Beth, can you give us your highlight in the last few minutes, what folks need to know and be paying attention to from a legislative perspective? 
I think we really, Jim summed it up. We've really talked about almost all of it. And it's pay attention to your legislators and ask your legislators just to step outside the box and not look at just one side of the issue because there's two sides to every issue and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And if your legislators are more diligent and they understand the issues that are facing them and you, the viewers out there, you tell your legislator, this is what we know to be happening. We heard this and the individuals like Jim and I have nothing to gain at all by telling you folks the truth, except for maybe we'll get a little traction and we'll have lower energy bills. But speak up, stand up and look at what these energy sources really are and look at what government's doing and mm -hmm. try to look at it objectively, look at both sides because that way you're going to come and you're going to see that every Jim and I are telling you is the truth and that you can make a difference. You can all make a difference out there. Every one of you, you can start paying attention and it's hard and it makes your eyes glaze over sometimes, but it's, it's, it's up to every one of you. It's up to every one of you to to look because it affects you all and it really does matter. And where we are today because of bad policy. That's it. That's incredible. That's that's really what I'm hearing for a summary in my brain is that the, the policies that are put in place in Augusta really do matter to our every single day life. And it, if if the number in my on my CMP bill is so drastically impacted by the policies passed in Augusta and by who our legislators are and who they're listening to and how they're voting, then I think we all have to be paying pretty close attention to who is in Augusta and how are they voting and what policy are they supporting? So thank you both Beth and Jim for being on. You guys have been awesome guests. I have learned a ton and I'm sure that the, those watching at home have as well. So thank you both so, so much. And I look forward to chatting next time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laurel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. Love you. <laughs> Bye all. Have a great night.